How to Own Your Own Mind by Napoleon Hill Andrew Carnegie's Analysis of Controlled Attention The analysis begins in Mr. Carnegie's private study in 1908 when I first met and interviewed him. Hill Mr. Carnegie, will you describe how controlled attention can be applied in the practical affairs of life? Carnegie Now let us define the term, controlled attention, and make sure we understand exactly what it means. It is the act of combining all the faculties of the mind and concentrating them upon the attainment of a definite purpose. The time involved in the act of concentration of thought on a given subject depends upon the nature of the subject and upon that which one expects in connection with it. Take my own case, for example. The dominating forces of my mind are, and have been for many years, concentrated upon the making and the marketing of steel. I have others allied with me who likewise concentrate their dominating thoughts upon the same objective. Thus we have the benefit of controlled attention in collective form, consisting, as it does, of the individual mind power of a great number of people, all working toward the same end, in a spirit of harmony. Hill Could you not have carried on other business activities just as successfully as you conducted the steel industry, and at the same time? Wouldn't the mastermind principle have made this possible? Carnegie Yes, I have known men to conduct many separate, unrelated businesses successfully, with the aid of the mastermind, but I have always believed they would have done much better had they confined their efforts entirely to one line of business. Splitting one's attention has the effect of dividing one's powers. The best plan for anyone to follow is to devote all his energies to some specific field. This concentration enables one to specialize in that field. Hill But, what about the doctors who engage in general practice? Do they not have a better opportunity to add to their income than those who specialize in one particular branch of medicine? Carnegie No, the exact opposite is true. If you ever have occasion to engage a specialist to remove your appendix, as I have had, you will learn that specialization in medicine pays. When I was a small boy the old family physician who used to look after the health of the people of our neighborhood would have removed an appendix for $25, and I suspect he could have done the job about as well as the specialist who charged me more than ten times that amount. But, I called in the specialist just the same. Hill Does this same rule apply in the field of retail merchandising? Carnegie Yes, it applies in every line of business and every calling. Modern merchandising has practically made the old-fashioned general store obsolete. While the most prosperous stores are departmentalized, they are not the same as the old general merchandise stores, because each department is managed by a specialist who devotes all his time to that department. You might say that a modern department store is nothing but a group of highly specialized stores, all operating under one roof and one general overhead, but possessing increased buying power that gives the store a tremendous advantage over smaller stores. Hill You would say, then, that the department store is managed under the principle of controlled attention. Carnegie That and other principles of the philosophy of individual achievement, especially the mastermind principle and definiteness of purpose. Hill What about the banking business? Is it managed, also, by application of the principle of controlled attention? Carnegie Very much so. Every department of a large bank, and practically every individual position in each department, is highly specialized. The same is true of railroading. Practically every position in the railroad business is specialized. Promotions are from the bottom upward, and the men holding the more responsible positions have had training in nearly all the subordinate positions, but they never undertake to hold two jobs at the same time. It is the same in the steel industry. Men become highly skilled by confining their efforts to specialized work. Here, too, promotions are from the bottom upward. All of our headmen have served their apprenticeship in subordinate jobs in the operating end of the business. Hill You believe, then, that the better opportunities of the future will be available to those who concentrate their efforts along some specialized lines. Carnegie It has always been that way and it always will be. Hill What about the profession of teaching? 
Is it not possible for a teacher to prepare himself to teach many different subjects? Carnegie Oh, yes, it is possible, but not advisable. The big universities are nothing but a group of associated colleges, each specializing in some particular branch of education. If it were practical for a teacher to do better work by devoting his efforts to a diversity of subjects, the universities would have discovered this long ago. Hill What about the student who is preparing himself for a life work? Should he specialize in some particular branch of education? Carnegie Yes, if he knows what his definite major purpose in life is to be. Otherwise he should confine his efforts to a general educational course until such time as he chooses a goal. Then he should continue his education through specialized training. The lawyer, for example, usually takes a course in general education, and then specializes in law. The doctor usually does likewise. General education gives one an approach to organized thinking, self-discipline, and self-reliance, all essential qualities for success in any calling. Hill. What about the stenographer? Should he or she concentrate on one line of work? Carnegie. Well, the stenographer must specialize, obviously, before procuring a position. After that he may have to engage in general service for a time, but the stenographer who does not wish to remain in that sort of work takes stock of his opportunities while engaged in general office work, and sooner or later specializes in some particular department through which he can promote himself to a better position. Many of the more successful business and industrial leaders of our times got their start through stenographic positions, where they had an opportunity to study the methods of their superiors. This is among the finest of all types of office work as far as preparation for executive responsibilities is concerned. The stenographer literally goes to a school taught by highly skilled executives and is paid for doing so. Hill. What about the farmer? Should he specialize, also? Carnegie. Yes, he should, but usually he does not. This is one of the major weaknesses of agriculture. The men who are making the most money from the soil are those who specialize in certain crops, such as wheat, rye, barley, and corn. The farmer who raises a little of everything very seldom receives much for anything he raises. Hill. What about the bookkeeper? Should he specialize, too? Carnegie. Yes, unless he is contented to remain always a bookkeeper, and even then he will make more from his work if he specializes in a particular branch of accounting. The better paid men in this field usually branch out from general bookkeeping to auditing and the installation of accounting systems. A clever man in this field finds it quite profitable, for every business beyond the one man's size needs dependable records of its transactions. The jack-of-all-trades usually is good at none. There is some part that everyone can take in the scheme of affairs, some part through which he can render useful service and gain his just compensation. It is everyone's responsibility to find out what this part is, and to prepare himself for it. All well-ordered life requires preparation. Before one begins to prepare, he should know for what he is preparing himself. That, within itself, is concentration of effort. The man who has no definite purpose in life, who cannot do some one thing and do it well, is like a dry leaf on the bosom of the wind. He will be tossed here and there, wherever the winds of chance carry him, but, like the rolling stone, he will gather no moss. Unfortunately, the majority of people spend their lives in thus rolling. Hill. Do you mean that a man should choose his definite major purpose before beginning his education, and prepare himself to specialize in connection with that aim? Carnegie. No, not always. Seldom is a very youthful person, who has not finished his basic education, in a position to adopt a definite major purpose. In that case he should complete his essential education, through the grades in high school. If he still is unable to choose a major purpose in life he should either go to work and learn, from experience, of the possibilities of different occupations, or go to college and take a general liberal arts educational course. After that one should be able to decide what calling he wishes to follow. Hill. Suppose a person chooses a definite major purpose, but finds, after he pursues it for a while, 
that he dislikes it, or he finds something he likes better. Should he make a change? Carnegie. Yes, by all means. A man will succeed best in that which he likes best, all else being equal. It is advisable for one to change, provided he does not get into the habit of changing every time the work he has chosen becomes difficult, or he meets with temporary defeat. Changing from one line of work to another involves a tremendous loss. It is something like an industrial plant, the management of which changes from one product to another. The successful person must reach the stage of specialization, sooner or later, the sooner, the better. Hill Is it advisable for a businessman to engage in politics? Carnegie Not if he wishes to succeed in business. Politics is a profession unto itself, and not a very dependable one at that. But it is a profession, and those who succeed best at it are those who do nothing else. Hill what sort of career would you advise a young man to choose? A professional career or a business career? Carnegie. That depends upon the young man, his likes and dislikes, his native ability, his physical conditions, etc. Generally speaking I would say that business and industry offer much broader opportunities than do the professions, because the professions are overcrowded already. This is essentially an industrial nation. Industry is the backbone of our economic structure. And I have never seen the time when a reliable, loyal, and capable man could not find his place in industry. Here is where most of the larger fortunes are made, which, within itself, partly answers your question, since most people choose a career with the object of earning a living and accumulating as much wealth as possible. There always has been a shortage of capable men at the head of industry, but never a shortage in the professions. Hill. What about the army, or the navy, or the government service as a career? Are there desirable opportunities in any of these three branches of service? Carnegie. Again I must say that this depends very largely on the person who is choosing the career. If a man wishes an opportunity to engage in a creative effort, he would not choose the government service as career, since his chances there would become a matter of the whims of politicians. He would fare better in either the army or the navy, since these are somewhat further removed from political influence. Some have made commendable records in both of these fields of the service, but generally they were men who liked that sort of life. The line of promotion in both the army and the navy is rather long and by no means easy. Military service calls for concentrated effort and a definite limitation of ambition, as the possibilities of advancement are known in advance. Some men are not suited, by nature, to limit themselves in this manner. They prefer to take their chances in business or industry, where the risks may be greater and the work harder, but the possibilities of achievement are without any fixed limits. Hill Then you recommend concentration of effort, through specialization, in all callings? You believe, obviously, in a one-track mind? Carnegie Specialization through concentration of effort, gives one greater power. It saves lost motion in both thought and physical action. It harmonizes with the principle of definiteness of purpose, the starting point of all achievement. I believe in a one-track mind if you allow me to describe it this way, a wide range of knowledge based on facts related to one's major purpose, but expressed through organized plans for the attainment of that purpose. I might make my meaning better understood if I stated it this way, a man should have a multiple, track mind for the accumulation of knowledge, but a single track mind for the expression of that knowledge, which is about the same as saying that one should have a reserve of both general and specific knowledge, but he should concentrate its use upon the attainment of a definite major purpose. Knowledge gives one no power until it is organized and expressed in action. That requires concentration of effort. A man may be a walking encyclopedia of general knowledge, and I have known such people, but his knowledge will be practically useless until he organizes it and gives it some form of expression, through definiteness of purpose. Now, if you wish an excellent example of the power of controlled attention I'll give you one. You are a young man, with most of your life ahead of you. Sooner or later, no doubt, you will give some thought to marriage, but before you make a choice you may look around considerably, analyzing many, suspects, 
before you find an acceptable prospect for marriage. When you find one whom you believe to be your choice, observe how quickly and definitely you will begin to concentrate your attention upon this one woman. There's the time and the place to watch your step, for concentration of effort leads to climax of action, and this applies not only in the choice of a mate in marriage, but in all other human relationships. Concentration of attention leads to lasting friendships, and permanent business alliances, and to other permanent relationships. It leads to repeated successes, and over time, success consciousness becomes a habit. Hill You speak of success consciousness as becoming a habit. I have observed that most people have a failure consciousness. How is this habit acquired? Carnegie By the same method that the success consciousness is acquired, the concentration of attention upon failure and habits that lead to failure. Such habits, for example, as procrastination, fear, indecision, and indifference to opportunity. Through the principle of autosuggestion, one's dominating thoughts and physical habits become a fixed part of one's permanent character. Concentration of thought on any subject attracts to one the circumstances by which the physical counterpart of the thought is created. Hill And it is by this means that thought becomes transformed into physical things. Carnegie. I would state it slightly differently. It is by this means that thought attracts one to its physical counterpart. Thought does not actually become transformed into material things, or at least we have no substantial evidence that it does, but thought does attract some combination of circumstances by which its physical counterpart is assembled or drawn to one. And it does this by the aid of whatever natural means are available. For example, Definiteness of purpose inspires one to engage in physical action in carrying out the object of that purpose. Thus, while thought did not actually attract the physical counterpart of the purpose, it inspired the individual to procure it, through the most logical means available. Hill Then there is no mystery connected with your statement that one's dominating thoughts tend to clothe themselves in their physical counterpart. Carnegie None whatsoever the method by which this takes place is as understandable as the multiplication table or the rules of grammar. Hill But there are schools of thought whose followers would have one believe that one's dominating thoughts, such as one engages in when praying, can attract their physical counterpart through some inexplicable mystery or supernatural law. Carnegie Well, they could be right about this, but I have never knowingly acquired any desirable results from thought, through any means that I could not explain by the laws of nature and the rules of ordinary human relationship. I have never depended upon supernatural law, for truthfully I know of no such law. I will say this, however, the circumstances through which definiteness of purpose attracts opportunities favorable to the realization of the purpose often are so unexpected that they appear inexplicable. I suspect, however, that accurate analysis would disclose that there is a perfectly logical and purely natural cause for every effect. Sometimes the effects of certain experiences of our lives are so far removed from the actual cause that we completely lose sight of the cause. I will give you a splendid example of what I mean. Some years ago I called in a young man who had been serving as the secretary to one of our executives, and, with very little explanation, promoted him to a very responsible executive position, at a big increase in salary. He was so surprised that he told one of his friends that the promotion was a miracle. Well, it may have seemed like a miracle to him, but let me tell you what caused it. That young man had acquired certain desirable habits which made him more valuable in a higher position. For example, he arrived at his work a half hour earlier than the rules of his department required, and did not quit work for an hour or more after the others in his department had gone home for the day. On many occasions he came back at night, when there was extra work to be done. No one asked him to do this. He was not given extra pay for doing it. But, he moved entirely on his own initiative, thus advertising to the management that he possessed initiative of a high order. Now, remember that personal initiative is a rare quality, and it is one of the major essentials of those who assume the responsibility of leadership in any calling. Well, the habit of going the extra mile was the first quality that attracted our attention to this young man. 
After he had come to our attention in this favorable light, we also observed that he had the habit of doing his work more neatly and thoroughly than others who were engaged in similar work. Then we noticed that he had an abundance of enthusiasm through which he inspired those around him to work in the right sort of mental attitude. We sent out an investigator and discovered that he was taking a night course in engineering, thus proving that he had definiteness of purpose. The investigator discovered, also, that this young man's home life was pleasant and he was popular with the neighbors, thus proving that he had an attractive personality. Now, in view of these discoveries, do you see anything in connection with his promotion that savored of the supernatural, or the miraculous? Yet, these are the sort of miracles which enable some to get ahead while others around them, who have just as much education and as much knowledge of their work, fail to get ahead. We promoted this young man because, by his own habits, his own mental attitude and self-discipline, he had earned the right to promotion. When the promotion came, it came as the result of the natural cause of promotions. Perhaps the promotion seemed like a miracle to him because it came before he had planned it. And that is another queer thing about men who prepare themselves for the better things of life. The better things have a way of appearing before they are expected. Hill. And you believe that it is through similar circumstances that all men who succeed attain their success. Carnegie. I am sure of it. I have had the privilege of promoting as many men as has any other industrialist in America, if not in fact more. I have carefully analyzed the cause of every promotion I have made and I can state definitely that every such promotion was earned well in advance by the person who was promoted. The only part one took in the transaction was to discover those who had earned promotions, and generally speaking I did not have to spend much time in this direction, because men who prepare themselves for promotion develop habits which are so obvious that they cannot be overlooked by an intelligent employer who, if he succeeds, must be eternally on the lookout for men who are capable of assuming responsibilities. You may think that a promotion is a great favor to the one promoted, but let me tell you that it is no greater favor to him than it is to the man who does the promoting, provided he picks the man who is entitled to promotion. But, in final analysis, all just promotions are self-acquired, through self-discipline, training, and preparation. Hill. You do not believe, then, that chance or luck favors one under such circumstances. Carnegie. Only to this extent, it sometimes happens that the time of a man's promotion is the result of some form of luck or chance, such as the death of a person to whose position he is promoted, or an emergency calling for some special form of talent which the promoted person possesses, but the luck is related only to the time. Such a person who is entitled to promotion will get it sooner or later, luck or no luck, because every man gravitates to the place in life where he belongs, by preparation and acquired habit, as naturally as water flows downhill. Nothing can change this, no matter by what name one calls the circumstance. He can call it luck, or a fortunate break, or whatever he pleases, but let me tell you that the only sort of luck any man can depend upon is that which he provides for himself, through painstaking preparation for whatever he desires in life. Hill. Your analysis indicates that controlled attention is an important feature in one's preparation for promotion, or the attainment of any definite purpose. Carnegie. Yes, an indispensable feature, you might say. It is impossible for a man to develop the habit of self-discipline, so necessary as a means of preparation for the attainment of a definite purpose, without concentration of his attention. He should practice this art until it becomes a habit. The place to begin is with the small details of one's daily work, where one has a definite motive for concentration of his attention. If one slights the minor details of his work, he will be sure to slight the more important features. Thoroughness, through concentrated attention, is a virtue of priceless value. Hill. But, is it not true, Mr. Carnegie, that busy executives do not spend their time in managing minor details connected with their responsibilities? Carnegie. Yes, that is true, but you overlook one important fact. The successful executive usually attains his position by having first acquired the art of mastering details. If he remains a successful executive he must continue to be the master of details, but he usually relegates minor details to subordinates who act for him. 
Thus, by the use of the mastermind principle, he continues to attend to all necessary details. A man is paid for that which he does or that which he can influence others to do. The able executive is the man who has so related himself to others that he can increase their efficiency, thereby adding to his own. The man who is clever at getting work done, and done well, by others is worth much more than the man who does it. But, he must know details. If he doesn't, he will not know how to relegate details to subordinates. Hill. Does controlled attention bring other benefits than those which are available from its application in human relationships such as you have mentioned? Carnegie. Yes, many of them. Let us name a few of the major benefits. First, controlled attention is the means by which an individual gains control over the faculties of his own mind, through self-discipline. That is important enough to justify all the time one might put into developing the habit of concentration, but there are other advantages. It is the major means by which all voluntary habits are developed. It is also the means by which one may eliminate undesirable habits. It can be used to clear the mind of fear and doubt, thus preparing the way for the exercise of faith. It is the medium by which the mind may be cleared for prayer, for concentration on a definite desire, in a spirit of faith, is prayer. All these are benefits an individual may enjoy, through the application of concentrated attention, without contact with anyone. Hill. It seems, from your analysis, that controlled attention is associated, in one way or another, with every function of both the body and the mind. Carnegie. That is true. You might well have said it is associated with every function of the mind and the body, and every important human relationship as well. You should observe, also, that controlled attention is a degree of self-hypnosis, through which a man can prepare his mind for any reality he has to meet in life. Intense concentration of thought gives one the benefit of the power of that strange state of mind known as hypnotism. Some have used this power effectively in curing certain forms of disease. It can be used to master sorrow and grief and disappointment, where it is applied in conjunction with the power of the will. Hill Isn't controlled attention always the result of the use of the faculty of the will? Carnegie No, it may be applied through either the faculty of the emotions or the faculty of the will. It may also be applied through a combination of both the emotions and the will. When it is applied by the power of will, it becomes the master of the emotions. Hill and that is the means by which one may place all emotions under the control of the will. Carnegie Correct. Intense concentration of the attention upon a given subject, through the aid of the will, leaves the emotions no means of expression. The order can be reversed, as it generally is, and the mind may be so intensely concentrated on a given subject, with the aid of the emotions, that the faculty of the will becomes powerless to operate. The choice between the emotions and the will, in any given instance, is with the individual. Hill. Which is the safer choice, the emotions or the will? Carnegie. The will is safer, provided it is applied in conjunction with the faculty of reason and the conscience. The emotions and reason often disagree. That is one thing that causes trouble for so many people. They allow their emotions to have full sway, without the modifying influence of the reason. The person who has developed a high degree of self-discipline has the power to give expression to either his will or his emotions, or to subdue one in favor of the other, as he chooses. This is the ideal attainment in self-control. Hill From all you have said I deduce that the sort of thought power which lifts one above the ordinary limitations of fear and sorrow and discouragement is that which one attains only by controlled attention, backed by definiteness of purpose. Perhaps the leaders who rise above mediocrity and make high places for themselves, in their chosen calling, are those who have acquired the habit of concentrated effort. Carnegie Yes, and the best evidence that this is true may be found in the fact that the more successful people of the world, from as far back as we have any records of human achievement, have always been one-idea people. That is, they have acquired an obsession for the attainment of some single purpose, and they have concentrated the major portion of their time and thought upon that subject. 
It is often a mistake to assume that the term one-track mind is an epithet, for it may connote distinguished honor, instead. When asked by a friend what he believed to be the greatest human problem, a distinguished philosopher replied, the greatest problem? Why, the greatest problem by which anyone is confronted is that of learning how to concentrate his thought power on his problems until he burns a hole through them. With that statement I fully agree. It has always been a source of astonishment to me, why so many people waste enough energy worrying about problems when it could enable them to find a solution, if the energy were concentrated upon that definite end. Hill Do people who have a definite major purpose in life, and devote their time to its attainment, worry over problems the same as those without such a purpose? Carnegie, no, they do not. Definiteness of purpose, backed by a plan for its attainment, tends to conserve one's energies for the sole purpose of attaining that purpose. Worry is the brainchild of the man who is not definite. The very moment one decides what action he is going to take in connection with any problem, and begins to carry out his decision, he usually ceases to waste any of his energies worrying over it. Hill Action must accompany decision, however. Decision, without physical action, may still leave one room for worry. Carnegie You have the idea correctly. One of the greatest of all forms of concentrated action is that of intense effort, behind a definite purpose, commonly known as work. I have known this to correct physical ailments, and it is the world's finest formula for mental disturbances. Most so-called bad dispositions could be cured through a stiff workout in some sort of physical labor sufficient to work up a good sweat. Analyze a busy man, in whatever calling you choose, and observe how very little time he wastes over worries. And, if he happens to be a man who has acquired an understanding of the power of concentrated effort, through the coordination of thought and physical action, you will find him spending not one second on worries. But you will find that he makes decisions definitely and promptly, moves on his own initiative, without supervision or urge from others, has an abundance of enthusiasm, has confidence in himself and faith sufficient to drive him forward in the pursuit of the object of his purpose. Hill Yes, I see now why you say that controlled attention is the master key that unlocks the doors to the solution of many problems on the one hand, and unlocks the doors to greater opportunities on the other hand. Carnegie That states the matter very clearly. It might also be stated this way, controlled attention locks the doors behind things we do not want and opens the door to the things we do want. Therefore, it is a master key in fact as well as in theory. Hill. Would it be correct to say that controlled attention becomes a master key that locks the doors against things one does not want and opens the doors of opportunity to things one does want, because it conditions the mind for that state of mind known as faith? Carnegie. That would be literally correct, but controlled attention does more than prepare the way for faith, it inspires physical action back of one's faith. It also inspires other success qualities, such as enthusiasm initiative, self-discipline, definiteness of purpose, creative vision, and organized thought. Controlled attention magnetizes the brain with the nature of one's dominating thoughts, aims, and purposes, thus causing one to be always in search of every necessary thing that is related to one's dominating thoughts. For example, let us say that a man makes up his mind to find a more responsible and better paying position. From the moment that he reaches a decision in his mind to find such a position he will find himself searching the help-wanted columns of the newspapers and making inquiries among friends. His imagination will become keener and he will begin to devise ways and means of finding what he desires. In proportion as he concentrates his mind on the subject will he extend the scope of his search until he will eventually find that for which he is searching. It may come from a source he least expects, but careful analysis would be almost certain to prove that it came because of some physical action, or some spoken word on his part. Concentration on a definite purpose, in a spirit of enthusiasm, puts the subconscious mind to work on establishing ways and means of carrying out that purpose. I have heard experienced detectives say that rarely is a crime committed that cannot be solved by concentration of attention. Often there is no evidence whatsoever as to who the perpetrator of a crime was, 
but the seasoned detective can take hold of such a case and, by the simple process of asking questions among those who are familiar with the crime, very soon unearth clues that lead to the solution. Controlled attention is the detective's greatest aid in the solution of crime. As a matter of fact many successful detectives have no other outstanding qualification in this field except keen power of observation and the power of intense concentration of their minds. If these two qualities are useful in the solution of crimes, and obviously they are, they are equally helpful in the solution of other sorts of problems. Hill Yes, I can see that alertness in observation might be as helpful in searching for hidden opportunities for self-advancement as it is in the detection of crime. How does one develop the power of alertness of observation? Carnegie It is the result of habit based on motive. When a man adopts a definite major purpose and backs it with a strong motive for its attainment, he begins automatically to develop alertness of observation in connection with everything and everyone which may be even remotely associated with the attainment of that purpose. You see, motive magnetizes one's mind with a power that attracts everything which affects that motive. The policeman who walks a definite beat day after day will see much more of what goes on along his beat than will the average person who goes there only occasionally and has no particular reason for observing details in that neighborhood. It is said that an Indian warrior or hunter can track a man or an animal through a forest, although no tracks visible to the untrained person are in evidence. He has trained himself, through controlled attention, to observe details the untrained person never would recognize, and his motive is that of self-preservation. The Indian becomes alert in the observation of physical details of his environment because his living depends upon it. Follow the illustration on through and you will observe that most of the so, called self-made men have a keen imagination, initiative, self-reliance and perseverance, and this is due, in the main, to the fact that they were thrown on their own responsibility and forced to develop these qualities. They had a definite motive for the action which led to their success. A man without an obsessional motive is a man without power, or, if by chance he comes into power, he will not be able to hold it. Hill your illustration seems to suggest that motive may be an important factor in education. The teacher who can inspire the student with the strongest motive for learning might teach him more than the person who endeavored to force him to study because of fear of failure at examination time. Carnegie You have laid your finger on one of the most important factors of pedagogy. And the same theory would apply, in the relationship between employer and employee, or parent and child. The best way to induce anyone to do anything is by the provision of a motive sufficient to attract his attention and arouse his desire. Take your own mission in life, as an example. Your definite major purpose is to organize and distribute a philosophy of individual achievement. While your job may seem formidable as to its scope and the time required in which to do it, yet you are fortunate in that distribution of the philosophy will appeal to people through practically all of the basic motives. There will be no need, therefore, to try to force its acceptance, because it offers a practical approach to the things all normal people want most, particularly these. 1. Material wealth. 2. Love. 3. Freedom of body and mind. 4. Desire for personal expression leading to fame. 5. Self-preservation. Any time you can offer anyone anything that appeals to him through these five motives you may be sure of its ready and willing acceptance. Here you have five of the strongest motives that move people to action, under the more important circumstances of life. Therefore, no teacher of this philosophy will ever find it necessary to penalize any student of the philosophy in order to influence him or her to study. The motive for study already exists in the minds of all normal adults. For this same reason no student of the philosophy will find it difficult to concentrate his or her attention on the study of the philosophy. And, you see what an advantage this fact provides the student, because all habits are related to habits of a similar nature. The habit of controlled attention in connection with the study and application of this philosophy will develop other habits of concentration that will lead to a series of related motives associated with opulence and personal achievement. It is this peculiarity as to the multiplicity of motives that will induce people to master and apply this philosophy, 
and which enabled me to look ahead into the future and foresee that it will gather momentum and become a nationwide influence. In this fact you may find your major motive for devoting twenty years or more of temporarily profitless research to the organization of the philosophy, which you will be compelled to do before it will have been proved and accepted by the public. You, too, will move in response to the five motives I have mentioned, for your work offers reward through each of these. With this theory in mind I am now prepared to tell you that the major portion of the remainder of your life will be devoted to the organization and the distribution of this philosophy. You have already become sufficiently interested in the job ahead of you to enable me to prophesy that you could no more quit your job before it has been finished than a fly could escape from a sheet of fly paper, but not for the same reason. You will stick because you will desire to do so. Your desire is based on at least five strong motives, therefore, you will have no difficulty in concentrating your attention on your job. But you would have plenty of difficulty in trying not to do so. Hill And now, Mr. Carnegie, inasmuch as the philosophy of individual achievement is being organized to serve the people of the United States, will you analyze the opportunities for self-advancement under the American way of life, by explaining why concentrated effort is necessary for individual success under our economic system? Carnegie Yes, but the analysis will have to be broken down into many subjects before the real reason for concentrated effort is clear. We have already explained why an individual must organize his thought power and concentrate it upon one thing at a time, for this is the way to individual self-mastery upon which personal power is based. Let us now turn our attention to the external circumstances with which an individual must deal in his struggle for the attainment of his definite major purpose, or for the attainment of a mere living if his ambition carries him no further. To begin with let us observe that the American way of life is founded upon a system of government that was designed to consolidate the power of all the people in such a manner that it automatically provides every citizen with the utmost amount of liberty, personal freedom, and the privilege of marketing his talents through his own initiative, in proportion to their value as a service to others. Here, then, we begin to see concentration of power on a scale such as does not exist anywhere else, concentration under a system that gives the humblest citizen more rights and privileges and greater opportunities for the accumulation of private wealth than were possessed by kings and potentates of the ages that have passed. Hill the vast variety of opportunities for personal promotion and improvement that exist in the United States is the direct result of the power the people have concentrated in their form of government. Thus it is the application of concentrated effort, on a huge scale, which provides every individual with the privilege of concentrating upon work of his own choice. Carnegie That states the matter perfectly. Concentration of the many provides the privilege of concentration by individuals. Thus concentrated power becomes a form of insurance against interference with personal rights and property rights, under the greatest system of human relationship known to the world. Now let us see what the people have done with the privilege they enjoy under this system, for here is where the greatest variety of personal opportunities exist. First, let us recognize that this is essentially an industrial country, the major business of which is the making and the distribution of useful articles. The manufacturing and the distribution are carried on by the people themselves, under an industrial management system known as free enterprise operating under the profit motive. It would not operate for the benefit of all under any other system, for there must be a motive to inspire action in all walks of life. We have a motive behind our industrial system which is elastic enough to provide everyone connected with it with the necessary inspiration for action based on his best efforts, since the system pays the individual according to his talents, education, experience, native ability, and ingenuity of mind. The system has no stopgaps on individual talent, but it has been so ingeniously designed that it encourages everyone to render the greatest service of which he is capable, knowing, in advance, that his remuneration will be in proportion to the service he renders. This system encourages the development of definiteness of purpose, personal initiative, self-reliance, enthusiasm, imagination, creative vision, organized thought, and the other success principles included in this philosophy. Now let us see, who owns American industry? 
We operate under a system of corporations in which the humblest person may own an interest according to his financial resources, and the larger corporations, such as the railroad companies, the steel industry, and the telephone and communication companies, are owned by a cross-section of the people representing almost every type of person in every calling who have invested their savings in the shares of these corporations. To make it convenient for the owners of the shares to acquire and sell their holdings in these shares, at will, we maintain a stock exchange where anyone may either sell or buy shares in almost any corporation that is listed as having the right to offer its shares to the public. Thus the ownership of the industries is so flexible that it never remains the same two days in succession. Here, again, we see concentration on a huge scale, the concentration of the savings of millions of men and women who own the shares of the corporations that operate industry. The shares in the well-managed corporations are so flexible that their owners may use them as collateral for borrowing money at banks in times of emergencies, without losing their interest in the corporation. Thus one may have his money invested in industry and still have the use of it for other purposes. The manpower that operates the industries is made up of men known as the management and others known as the workers, both of which groups may be also owners in the business or not, as they choose. Generally, however, a majority of the men who work in both of these groups own shares in the business for which they work. Thus they are, in a broader sense, working for themselves. This is another method of providing men with an appropriate motive for rendering useful service to the extent of their capacity, education, and experience. It is a practice in all the better managed corporations to leave the door of opportunity for individual promotions wide open to every worker. Thus no one need remain in a lowly position if he has ambition for a better position, or can develop such ability through his experience. The system of individual promotion is so efficient that many of the larger corporations have talent scouts constantly in search of men who have the ability for leadership. There always has been and perhaps there always will be a shortage of men in the management group, at the top. This condition provides the greatest of motives for the exercise of individual initiative, imagination, and alertness on the part of the workers. Never, in the history of mankind, has a more efficient system of human relationship in the field of economics been devised, for it obviously provides every person with an outlet for such talents as he may possess, and it goes much further by providing one with an adequate motive for improving his talents by studying special training courses. Hill it would be correct, then, to say that advancement is rapid and sure for those who master and apply the principles of this philosophy. Carnegie To be sure. That is the purpose of organizing the philosophy, to enable ambitious people to learn how to concentrate all their energies upon the attainment of whatever station in life they aspire to hold. Now, sum up all these factors I have mentioned and observe that I have been describing the American way of life, under which every individual may have the use and benefits of his share of the stupendous power of the United States, a power that has been developed by the concentration and harnessing of the people's combined wealth, talents, special abilities, and educational facilities. Hill. Can you think of any improvements in the American way of life, and our economic system, which you believe might add to the benefits it provides the individuals who participate in it? Carnegie. The system is the best that civilization has yet produced, and although it is subject to minor refinements, it is basically sound because it provides the utmost of personal liberty, rewards, personal initiative, and encourages the utmost of personal ambition by providing every individual with an adequate motive for growth through useful service. The improvements should be in the method of operating the system, not in the system itself. Hill that is only another way of saying that the improvements should be in individuals and not in the system. Carnegie That's the exact idea I had in mind, and the major purpose of this philosophy is to help bring about improvements in individuals, so they may better enjoy the privileges of the American way of life by rendering greater service under the system. Hill You believe, then, that one of the major improvements that an individual could make in himself is that of concentrating all his energies upon some definite major purpose associated with the American way of life. Carnegie Yes, that is the purpose of my philosophy of American achievement. 
It is designed to give every individual the fullest possible benefit of the best that has been learned from the experience of the most successful men the American way of life has produced. The philosophy is a combination of the theory and the practice of sound fundamentals that harmonize with the American way of life. It not only explains what to do in order to achieve individual success, but it also describes how to do it. The entire philosophy is a highly concentrated presentation of the rules of human relationship that are known to be sound and workable because they have been tried and found efficient. Hill What do you believe to be the greatest danger that may disrupt the human relationships under the American way of life? Carnegie The greatest danger consists in the philosophy of a small minority of people with socialistic tendencies who wish to break up the power which has been concentrated for the benefit of the people, through the American way of life. These misguided people would have us believe it helpful to decentralize the power that has been accumulated through the consolidation of the money and the talents of the people, under our industrial system. Instead of our being permitted to pool our savings and use them as operating capital in the management of the corporations, as we now do, the socialists would have us destroy this consolidation of power by dividing it up among individuals, not recognizing the fallacy in the fact that no one individual would have enough capital to produce an automobile, or provide a transportation system such as the railroads, or build a home, or supply any of the other modern luxuries and necessities of life such as we now enjoy under our present standard of living. Decentralizing the wealth of America would be about the same as decentralizing the power of the army, by giving every soldier the right to conduct himself independently of the others, thus leading to the destruction of the power that comes from concentrated effort. Hill You believe, then, in concentration of power under a system that functions through chosen leaders? Carnegie Yes, chosen leaders, not leaders who have assumed the power of leadership without the consent of those whom they lead. We have, in the American industrial system, the finest example of concentrated power that is administered through leaders chosen by those from whom the power is obtained. This is pure democracy in its finest working order. The power comes from concentration of the wealth and the personal services of those who operate industry. It is administered by leaders who are chosen by the owners of the operating capital, made up, as they are, of people of all walks of life, known as, management. Here leaders are chosen on the basis of their qualifications for leadership, consisting of their education, experience, and native ability. If a mistake is made in choosing any individual leader, it can be corrected from the same source that the mistake is made. The system under which American industry is operated is similar to the system under which the government operates. The power of the United States, which is the envy of the world, consists of the coordination between our system of government and the other systems of our economic and industrial life, all of which constitute what we call the American way of life. Hill What, in your opinion, Mr. Carnegie, is the greatest tangible virtue of that which you call the American way of life? Carnegie. Its greatest virtue consists in the fact that it provides all the people with the utmost personal liberty and the privilege of living their own lives in their own way, with the greatest opportunity for self-determination and the accumulation of individual wealth. Instead of penalizing personal ambition and individual desires, as is the case under many other systems that have been tried and are being tried in other countries, the American way of life places a premium on these human traits, by rewarding everyone in proportion to his contributions to society as a whole. Hill One might say, then, that the American way of life is the world's most impressive demonstration of the power of concentration of human endeavor. Carnegie That would be stating the facts correctly. Ours is the most powerful government of the world. Ours is the richest country of the world. Our people are the freest people of the world, and the richest as individuals. Our system of economics and our social systems provide the people with more luxury than any other people enjoy, and those of us who adjust our mental attitude to harmonize with the American way of life have more peace of mind than any other people of the world. Hill Your advice to the American people, I assume, would be to let well enough alone, by making the most of the American way of life. Carnegie Yes, my advice would be to let the American way of life alone as it is. 
Those who feel that improvements should be made in any portion of our economic or social system should begin the improvements they recommend by applying them in their own lives. If anyone thinks he can improve the American way of life, let him first demonstrate the soundness of his plan by making it work in his own life. Then the rest of us will be glad to adopt his system, if it proves to be better than our present system. Hill. In other words you would recommend to those who wish to divide up the wealth equally, that they get together, form a colony of their own, and divide up their personal possessions. Then, after they prove that they can live better and be more prosperous and enjoy more of the luxuries of life than we possess, who believe in and adhere to the American way of life, we may be influenced to scrap our present system and adopt theirs. Carnegie. That's the idea. But I must call your attention to the fact that many such colonies have been tried already. So far not one of them has worked, and those who started the idea were forced to come back to our present system, where they could avail themselves of the benefits of the concentration of wealth and personal endeavor, under a democratic system of leadership. Hill. What was missing in those collective efforts, which prevented them from succeeding, Mr. Carnegie? It would appear that they were based on concentrated effort, through mutual consent of all concerned. Carnegie. Many essentials were missing. First, the profit motive, which causes individuals to exert their best efforts and act on their own initiative, was missing. Second, the spirit of self-determination was missing. Take away from a man his desire to become independent and you rob him of much of his initiative, enthusiasm, imagination, and self-discipline. When a man gives up his privilege of independence, he also gives up a proportionate amount of his enthusiasm and ambition. One of the most essential factors that was missing was the power that is acquired through the consolidation of a vast amount of wealth with an equally vast amount of manpower, such as we enjoy under the American way of life. Hill. I see what you mean. The socialist experiments have not worked because the individuals engaged in the movement lost the spirit of self-determination that is possessed by the man who moves on his own initiative, fixes his own habits of living, lives his own life and engages in his choice of occupations. Carnegie. Well, that was partially the cause of their failure. The important fact I wish to emphasize is this, socialistic colonies have not succeeded, whereas the American way of life has succeeded. These effects we are familiar with. As to the cause we may disagree, but as to the effects there can be no disagreement, for the facts speak for themselves. Even where socialistic colonies have existed for a time, they have not found any method of providing their members with the luxuries of life that the average person enjoys under the American way of life. At most they have provided the scantiest sort of a living, under conditions which deprive the members of the privilege of personal initiative. Therefore, the members must have been deprived, also, of the peace of mind possessed by the man who lives his own life. Hill. Yet there have been many different systems of cooperative societies which seem to have worked pretty well, Mr. Carnegie. Carnegie. Now you are getting into an entirely different field. Cooperation is vastly different from socialism. The principle of cooperation is one of the principles of the philosophy of individual achievement, under the American way of life, but it has nothing in common with socialism. Cooperation brings benefits without the loss of individual initiative and the right of free enterprise. Cooperation does not deprive a man of the motive which inspires him to use his imagination, enthusiasm, and creative vision. Cooperation is a part of the great American way of life through which the material resources and the manpower are coordinated so as to produce the greater combined power that is available for the people of America. There is cooperation in socialistic colonies, but the right motive to produce enduring power is missing. Controlled attention, Napoleon, is essential to a democratic free enterprise system, and is discouraged, diminished, and ultimately absent in a socialist system. How to own your own mind. Close attention to the chapters of this book will permit the reader to learn what Mr. Carnegie taught me many years ago. One must recognize opportunity through creative vision, Conceive how to capitalize on opportunity through organized thought, and control the mind's activities and direct them to a given end with controlled attention. You will then own your own mind and be ready to take necessary action to achieve your goal. 
You may have everything you desire if you desire it badly enough to inspire you to keep your mind fixed on its attainment. The human will can overcome any obstacle or any handicap, if a man has enough backbone to use it. That secret power from within, which has the answer to all problems, can be contacted through concentration of thought based on definiteness of purpose. When Thomas Jefferson decided to act, no unexpected obstacle could swerve him from his course, for he had considered carefully and well. You are the architect of your own career. Frank Channing Haddock